feminism concepts and theories welcome to lecture 23 as promised i'm going to go through some of the texts that i think typify fourth wave feminism and i want you to keep your attention focused on a couple of things like i said fourth wave feminism is very much about the values of feminism as we understand it but in a much more widespread communicative fashion not necessarily in a vocabulary familiar to feminist theory. At the same time, we now have an unprecedented increase in the ways in which feminism is being discussed and these texts typify these commonsensical ways of understanding the goals of feminism. So pay attention to the language, pay attention to the ways in which these issues are being simplified, they're being personalized, they are particular to a form of individual storytelling and how is it that you can then analyze them in relation to the trajectory of the feminist movement in general. So, the first text that I want to read from is Chimamanda Adichie's We Should All Be Feminists. Now, for those who aren't familiar, Adichie is a very prolific and well-known novelist and feminist. Her little essay, We Should All Be Feminists, has been widely quoted and read and has become greatly popular fodder for a commonsensical understanding of contemporary feminism. I want to read through it in entirety and not offer you much analysis. I want this to be a kind of homework for you to locate it within everything that you have read of feminism thus far. We should all be feminists. Okoloma was one of my greatest childhood friends. He lived on my street and looked after me like a big brother. If I liked a boy, I would ask Okoloma's opinion. Okoloma was funny and intelligent and wore cowboy boots that were pointy at the tips. In December 2005, in a plane crash in southern Nigeria, Okoloma died. It is still hard for me to put into words how I felt. Okoloma was a person I could argue with, laugh with and truly talk to. He was also the first person to call me a feminist. I was about 14, we were in his house arguing, both of us bristling with half-baked knowledge from the books we had read. I don't remember what this particular argument was about, but I remember that as I argued and argued, Okoloma looked at me and said, you know, you're a feminist. It was not a compliment. I could tell from his tone, the same tone with which a person would say, you're a supporter of terrorism. I did not know exactly what this word feminist meant, and I did not want Okoloma to know that I didn't know. So I brushed it aside and continued to argue. The first thing I planned to do when I got home was look up the word in the dictionary. Now fast forward to some years later. In 2003, I wrote a novel called Purple Hibiscus about a man who, among other things, beats his wife and whose story doesn't end too well. While I was promoting the novel in Nigeria, a journalist, a nice, well-meaning man, told me he wanted to advise me. Nigerians, as you might know, are very quick to give unsolicited advice. He told me that people were saying my novel was feminist and his advice to me, he was shaking his head sadly as he spoke, was that I should never call myself a feminist since feminists are women who are unhappy because they cannot find husbands. So I decided to call myself a happy feminist. Then an academic, a Nigerian woman, told me that feminism was not our culture, that feminism was un-African and I was only calling myself a feminist because I had been influenced by Western books, which amused me because much of my early reading was decidedly unfeminist. I must have read every single Mills and Boone romance published before I was 16. And each time I try to read those books called classic feminist texts, I get bored and I struggle to finish them. Anyway, since feminism was un-African, I decided I would now call myself a happy African feminist. Then a dear friend told me that calling myself a feminist meant that I hated men. So I decided I would now be a happy African feminist who does not hate men. 
at some point I was a happy African feminist who does not hate men and who likes to wear lip gloss and high heels for herself and not for men. Of course, much of this was tongue in cheek, but what it shows is how that word feminist is so heavy with baggage, negative baggage. You hate men, you hate bras, you hate African culture, you think women should always be in charge, you don't wear makeup, you don't shave, you're always angry, you don't have a sense of humor, you don't use deodorant. Now here's a story from my childhood. While I was in primary school in Sukkah, a university town in southeastern Nigeria, my teacher said at the beginning of term that she would give the class a test and whoever got the highest score would be the class monitor. Class monitor was a big deal. If you were class monitor, you could write down the names of noisemakers each day, which was heady enough power on its own. But my teacher would also give you a cane to hold in your hand while you walked around and patrolled the class for noisemakers. Of course, you were not allowed to actually use that cane, but it was an exciting prospect for the nine-year-old me. I was very much, I very much wanted to be class monitor and I got the highest score on the test. Then to my surprise, my teacher said the monitor had to be a boy. She had forgotten to make that clear earlier. She assumed it was obvious. A boy had the second highest score on the test and he would be monitor. What was even more interesting is that this boy was a sweet, gentle soul who had no interest in patrolling the class with a stick, while I was full of ambition to do so. But I was female and he was male and he became class monitor. I have never forgotten that incident. If we do something over and over again, it becomes normal. If we see the same thing over and over again, it becomes normal. If only boys are made class monitor, then at some point we will all think, even if unconsciously, that the class monitor has to be a boy. If we keep seeing only men as heads of corporations, it starts to seem natural that only men should be heads of corporations. I often make the mistake of thinking that something that is obvious to me is just as obvious to everyone else. Take my dear friend Lewis, who is a brilliant progressive man. We would have conversations and he would tell me, I don't see what you mean by things being different and harder for women. Maybe it was so in the past, but not now. Everything is fine now for women. I didn't understand how Lewis could not seem what seemed so evident. I love being back home in Nigeria and spend much of my time there in Lagos, the largest city and commercial hub of the country. Sometimes in the evenings when the heat goes down and the city has a slower pace, I go out with friends and family to restaurants or cafes. On one of those evenings, Lewis and I were out with friends. There is a wonderful fixture in Lagos, a sprinkling of energetic young men who hang around outside certain establishments and very dramatically help you park your car. Lagos is a metropolis of almost 20 million people with more energy than London, more entrepreneurial spirit than New York and so people come up with all sorts of ways to make a living. As in most big cities, finding parking in the evenings can be difficult, so these young men make a business out of finding spots and even when there are spots available, of guiding you into yours with much gesticulating and promising to look after your car until you get back. I was impressed with the particular theatrics of the man who found us a parking spot that evening and so as we are leaving, I decided to give him a tip. I opened my bag, put my hand inside my bag to get my money and I gave it to the man. And he, this man who was happy and grateful, took the money from me and then looked across at Lewis and said, thank you sir. Lewis looked at me surprised and asked, why is he thanking me? I didn't give him the money. Then I saw realization dawn on Lewis's face. The man believed that whatever money I had ultimately came from Lewis because Lewis is a man. This is just 
a small excerpt to tell you what are the ways in which forms of writing can also produce understandings about feminism and feminist theory. And of course, Adichie is a gifted writer. She is able to convey to you all of the things that I have been struggling to do through feminist theory in just a few pages. We are talking about cultural understandings of men and women. We are talking about women's right to work and have money, about women's capacity to be professional, about feminism itself as composed of angry women that she conveys so beautifully in just a few pages and in speaking in the personal by assuming a voice that is very much about feminist consciousness in that the personal is political. And this has been a very widely read book among fourth wave feminists and in the contemporary reading public. One reason of course is that Adichie is a very successful novelist and two, she wears the badge of a feminist and takes it seriously. This book came out of a TED talk where she spoke precisely in these words about coming to feminism through her own life experiences about having always already been a feminist. The second text I want to read from for you today is Rebecca Solnit's Men Explain Things to Me, the origin of the by now common phrase mansplaining. Men Explain Things to Me 2008. I still don't know why Sally and I bothered to go to that party in the forest slope above Aspen. The people were all older than us and dull in a distinguished way, old enough that we at 40-ish passed as the occasion's young ladies. The house was great, if you like Ralph Lauren style chalets, a rugged luxury cabin at 9,000 feet, complete with elk antlers, lots of kilims and a wood-burning stove. We were preparing to leave when our host said, no, stay a little longer so I can talk to you. He was an imposing man who had made a lot of money. He kept us waiting while the other guests drifted out into the summer night and then sat us down at his authentically grainy wood table and said to me, so, I hear you've written a couple of books, I replied, several actually. He said in the way you encourage your friend's seven-year-old to describe flute practice and what are they about? They were actually about quite a few different things, the six or seven out by then. But I began to speak only of the most recent on that summer day in 2003. River of Shadows, Edward Muybridge and the Technological Wild West, my book on the annihilation of time and space and the industrialization of everyday life. He cut me off soon after I mentioned Moybridge. And have you heard about the very important Moybridge book that came out this year? So caught up was I in my assigned role as ingenue that I was perfectly willing to entertain the possibility that another book on the same subject had come out simultaneously and I had somehow missed it. He was already telling me about the very important book with that smug look I know so well in a man holding forth, eyes fixed on the fuzzy far horizon of his own authority. Here, let me just say that my life is well sprinkled with lovely men, with a long succession of editors who have, since I was young, listened to and encouraged and published me with my infinitely generous younger brother with splendid friends of whom it could be said, like the clerk in the Canterbury Tales I still remember from Mr. Pellin's class on Chaucer, gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Still, there are these other men too. So, Mr. Very Important was going on smugly about this book I should have known when Sally interrupted him to say, that's her book, or tried to interrupt him anyway. But he just continued on his way. She had to say that's her book three or four times before he finally took it in. And then, as if in a 19th century novel, he went ashen. That I was indeed the author of the very important book, it turned out he hadn't read. Just read about it in the New York Times book review a few months earlier. So confused the neat categories into which his world was sorted that he was stunned speechless. For a moment, before he began holding forth again. 
Being women, we were politely out of earshot before we started laughing and we have never really stopped. I like incidents of that sort when forces that are usually so sneaky and hard to point out slither out of the grass and are as obvious as say an anaconda that's eaten a cow or an elephant turd on the carpet. The slippery slope of silencings. Yes, people of both genders pop up at events to hold forth on irrelevant things and conspiracy theories. But the out and out confrontational experience of the totally ignorant is, in my experience, gendered. Men explain things to me and other women whether or not they know what they are talking about. Some men. Every woman knows what I am talking about. It's the presumption that makes it hard at times for any woman in any field, that keeps women from speaking up and from being heard when they dare, that crushes young women into silence by indicating the way harassment on the street does that this is not their world. It trains us in self-doubt and self-limitation just as it exercises men's unsupported overconfidence. I wouldn't be surprised if part of the trajectory of American politics since 2001 was shaped by say the inability to hear Colleen Rowley, the FBI woman who issued those early warnings about Al-Qaeda and it was certainly shaped by a Bush administration to which you couldn't tell anything, including that Iraq had no links to Al-Qaeda and no WMDs or that the war was not going to be a cakewalk. Even male experts couldn't penetrate the fortress of its smugness. Arrogance might have had something to do with the war, but this syndrome is a war that nearly every woman faces every day. A war within herself too, a belief in her superfluity, an invitation to silence, one from which a fairly nice career as a writer with a lot of research and facts correctly deployed has not entirely freed me. After all, there was a moment there when I was willing to let Mr. Important and his overweening confidence bowl over my more shaky uncertainty. Bowl over my more shaky certainty. Don't forget that I've had a lot more confirmation of my right to think and speak than most women. And I've learned that a certain amount of self-doubt is a good tool for correcting, understanding, listening and progressing. Though too much is paralyzing and total self-confidence produces arrogant idiots. There's a happy medium between these poles to which the genders have been pushed, a warm equatorial belt of give and take where we should all meet. More extreme versions of our situation exist in, for example, those Middle Eastern countries where women's testimony has no legal standing, so that a woman can't testify that she was raped without a male witness to counter the male rapist, which there rarely is. Credibility is a basic survival tool. When I was very young and just beginning to get what feminism was about and why it was necessary, I had a boyfriend whose uncle was a nuclear physicist. One Christmas, he was telling, as though it were a light and amusing subject, how a neighbor's wife in a suburban bomb-making community had come out, had come running out of her house naked in the middle of the night screaming that her husband was trying to kill her. How I asked did you know that he wasn't trying to kill her? He explained patiently that they were respectable middle class people. Therefore, her husband trying to kill her was simply not a credible explanation for her fleeing the house yelling that her husband was trying to kill her that she was crazy, on the other hand. Even getting a restraining order, a fairly new legal tool, requires acquiring the credibility to convince the courts that some guy is a menace and then getting the cops to enforce it. Restraining orders often don't work anyway. Violence is one way to silence people, to deny their voice and their credibility, to assert your right to control over their right to exist. About three women a day are murdered by spouses or ex-spouses in this country. 
in the US. It's one of the main causes of death for pregnant women in the United States. At the heart of the struggle of feminism to give rape, date rape, marital rape, domestic violence and workplace sexual harassment legal standing as crimes has been the necessity of making women credible and audible. I tend to believe that women acquired the status of human beings when these kinds of acts started to be taken seriously, when the big things that stop us and kill us were addressed legally from the mid-1970s on, well after, that is, my birth. And for anyone about to argue that workplace sexual intimidation isn't a life or death issue, remember that Marine Lance Maria Lauterbach, age 20, was apparently killed by her higher-ranking colleague one winter's night while she was waiting to testify that he raped her. The burned remains of her pregnant body were found in the fire pit in his backyard. Being told that categorically he knows what he's talking about and she doesn't, however minor a part of any given conversation, perpetuates the ugliness of this world and holds back its light. After my book Wanderlust came out in 2000, I found myself better able to resist being bullied out of my own perceptions and interpretations. On two occasions around that time, I objected to the behavior of a man only to be told that the incidents hadn't happened at all as I said, that I was subjective, delusional, overwrought, dishonest, in a nutshell, female. Most of my life I would have doubted myself and backed down. Having public standing as a writer of history helped me stand my ground, but few women get that boost and billions of women must be out there on the 7 billion person planet being told that they are not reliable witnesses to their own lives, that the truth is not their property, now or ever. This goes way beyond men explaining things, but now it's part of the same archipelago of arrogance. Men explain things to me still, and no man has ever apologized for explaining wrongly things that I know, and they don't. Not yet. But according to the actuarial tables, I may have another 40-something years to live, more or less, so it could happen. Though, I am not holding my breath. Let's pause a few minutes to also draw out some commonalities between Adichie's text and Solnit's text. We are again talking about those who are writing from their own experiences and drawing broad generalizations about the relationships between men and women. But you also see in Solnit's instance that she's making connections between the small instance of a man explaining her own book to her and a larger world in which women are not taken seriously, where their credibility is constantly questioned and what that might mean for matters of life and death. In both these texts, there might be a sense that there is a simplistic understanding of who is a man and who is a woman very much not in keeping with how we've been discussing gender across these weeks. However, it's important to remember that to bridge theory and practice, to be able to look at everyday experience as not bearing one-on-one -on -one consonants with the movement of theory, we have to understand gender across all these fronts, of theory as not separate from practice, but of radical imaginative possibilities for a world still beleaguered by binary gender understandings. In other words, we need all forms of writing to be able to move forward the feminist project. That's all I have for you this week. We will continue our discussions on queer theory, gender, post-structuralism in the next week. Until then.